Is up. We now move on to questions to the Minister for Infrastructure. I call Mr Andy Allen. Mr Allen. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question 1. Members will recall I recently announced the notice to proceed with the scheme. This will allow my officials to begin consultations with key stakeholders, including the local community. The scheme remains a priority for myself, and I am committed to do all that I can to deliver it in the current financial context, working with the Finance Minister and, of course, other executive colleagues. As I have already said to this House, the scheme has to fit within a programme of works, and we need to do more to ensure not just that we have the funding to start the project, but we also have the funding in place to the end. Therefore, I will need to consider the funding for the project together with other priorities as part of my budget 2017-21 considerations before deciding whether to award the York Street interchange contract. There are huge demands on the infrastructure budget, and they are all competing. It is my job and that of my department to put our priorities in place so we can deliver as much as we can with the finances that are available to us and can do that strategically in the years ahead. In light of the Chancellor's autumn statement, I will continue to work with my executive colleagues to do all that I can to deliver this important scheme as well as the executive flagship projects. Mr. Allen, supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister believe there is any prospect of the £250 million announced in the Chancellor's statement for uh, infrastructure being used to ensure that this uh, vital project is commenced? Minister. Thank the member for a supplementary. Uh, it will be for the executive to come to a decision on how the £250 million uh, is divvied out. Of course, the £250 million the member alludes to uh, is for a range of infrastructure and capital projects, uh, some of which I have no doubt you know, my department will be able to deliver, uh, although I presume that the, the money will also be used for schools, for hospitals uh, and for new homes too. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister. Uh, could the Minister outline if he has done any sourcing of potential funds which could be used for this specific project and what those sources are, are coming back to him with anything definitive? Minister. Again, I thank the member for the supplementary. Yes, uh, I have uh, established uh, uh, an alternative financing unit within my department. Uh, to look at all available streams, not just for this particular project, but for all projects uh, as we go forward. I currently have somewhere in the region of £5 billion worth of projects sitting on my desk uh, that we could proceed with. However, I will only have in the region of about £1 to £1.5 billion over the next number of years. Uh, so if we are to progress with the schemes that I think are important for society, it's going to be important that I look across um, society, that I look across all possible means in which to deliver that. Uh, but we need to do so in a way which is effective for the public purse. Uh, I think in recent times uh, methods have been used that have not been effective for the public purse uh, and departments to today still suffer the consequences of bad financial decisions. I call William Humphrey. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Like me, I'm sure the Minister welcomed the announcement in the autumn statement last week by Her Majesty's Chancellor of an extra £250 million for Northern Ireland. Uh, this is welcome news. I welcome the comments made by uh, the Minister and his colleague, the Finance Minister, to this House last week. The Minister will know the importance of this interchange in terms of business, travel and tourism and into Northern Ireland PLC. Will the Minister, given that it will go ahead, will the Minister commit to work with constituents who, who I represent in uh, Tigers Bay, New Lodge, North Queen Street uh, and the Sailor Town to make sure that their community, which will obviously be affected by this, isn't adversely affected? Minister. Yes, absolutely, and I stressed the point uh, only last week, maybe the week before it was, I can't remember now, but it, that certainly this, this decision to proceed allows my department to go out and engage, as the independent inspector has mentioned in his report, to go out and engage with local communities, such as the communities you have just outlined, so that the, the proposals going forward does not adversely affect. There are some uh, final amendments to uh, detailed design uh, in and around, I know, for example, in and around the situation regarding the McGurk's Bar Monument, uh, Little George's Street, and some current anti-social behaviour underneath the bridge. So there is, there is work that my department can now engage with, and I'd be more than happy to extend that out to communities around the project. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, can the Minister give us assurance that any future funding allocations will be targeted towards addressing the current pressures, such as um, 
York Street, but also looking and addressing the, at the long-standing infrastructure deficits in the West. Minister. Yes, uh, absolutely. In infrastructure terms, there has been a regional imbalance for far too long uh, in the North. That's why I have been determined since coming into post uh, and very careful to say that I want to address that infrastructure deficit. Uh, I have also went to great lengths to say that a priority of mine will be road safety. Uh, in, as, as bad as congestion is, and we absolutely need to tackle the growing congestion in and around the York Street area, there are people dying in their scores on roads such as the A5. I think in the last decade alone, there's been close to 50 people killed uh, in road traffic accidents on that particular stretch of road. Uh, so for myself, when I come to strategic priorities, there could be nothing more strategic uh, than saving lives. Um, thank you, Minister, for, for answering your questions so far. Minister, could you now tell the House what criteria was used to prioritise other road schemes over the York Street interchange? Minister. There, I have yet, as I have outlined the, the previous question, uh, my department have four executive flagship priorities, priorities that your party will also have agreed with, as these, these uh, priorities were set out in a previous executive that I, have, that I have embraced. So unless the Alliance Party have changed its position and are now opposed to the development of the A6 and the A5 roads, the, the, the opposed to the development of the Belfast Transport Hub and opposed to the rapid transit project that is coming live into Belfast next year. Uh, the member will know full well what criteria is used. We move on. I call Mr Oliver McMullen. I must call you an ever at all question to you. I, I thank the member for this question, but, but perhaps we need to take some clarification from the outset. There are formal or designated coastal defences, and there is infrastructure such as roads and railways, which are along our coast, which perform a coastal protection function. But in most cases, this was not the original purpose of their construction. I can advise that DFI Rivers currently manage a network of designated coastal defences of approximately 26 kilometres in length. These designated coastal defences are designed to protect against coastal flooding and are subject to annual condition surveys carried out by DFI Rivers. There are no major improvement works planned in relation to the existing designated coastal defences. However, there are ongoing works, such as in East Belfast, to pr protect properties in the Sydenham area that are at, at risk from a tidal inuation, and these will add to the length of designated defences. A major study has also commenced to determine how to increase the standard of protection against a tidal flood event for Belfast City Centre, and again this may add to our designated coastal defences. However, my department also has to maintain its road and railway network assets and protect them from the effects of coastal erosion and coastal flooding. Storm surges and high tides after Christmas in 2013 caused extensive damage to such protective works along the Antrim and Down coast roads. In light of these severe winter storms and tidal surges, detailed inspections of the road protective works was completed during 2014. In addition, an extensive survey of the coastline around the Ards Peninsula, where it abuts the road, was carried out earlier this year. The information from these surveys is currently being assessed and will inform decisions regarding prioritising necessary repair works. In recent years, almost £2 million of capital investment has been spent on the installation of new protective works along the coast road in Antrim. This includes 800,000 of work completed during 2016 at seven different sites. I am very conscious that prevention is better than cure, and so my department seeks to identify areas where damage may be caused by the ravages of the sea to target our resources, but often it is difficult to predict where damage will occur. Remind the Minister of the two-minute rule, Mr McQuillan, supplementary. And can I thank the Minister for his detailed response? Uh, Minister, I'm sure you would agree with me that uh, putting confidence back into the public uh, is paramount. Have you any uh, plans to um, uh, visit the frequency of, of the visits of the coastal uh, flood defences, especially in my own constituency of East Antrim? Minister. Well, yeah, I thank the member for, for his interest indeed uh, in this issue. It is an issue we, we have discussed at length. At, Separate times. I also want to put on record my thanks to the Agriculture and Environment Minister, Michelle McLevine, who I again meet next week to discuss this particular issue. Uh, our officials from both departments are working tirelessly behind the scenes 
uh, to compile reports for us to, to take forward a number of decisions uh, on the best way forward. Regarding inspections, inspections of flood defences are risk-based. The higher the risk of failure, the more frequent the inspection. All but two of the coastal flood defences are very high consequence, uh, i.e. substantial economic, social and environmental impact if the defence fails. Defences, and they are given a detailed inspection annually or after each extreme weather event. The other two flood defences are medium consequences and are expected every three years or after extreme weather events. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, I thank the Minister. Would he agree with me that the Executive needs to adopt uh, a new policy to replace the uh, old, outdated and discredited Bateman formula of October uh, 1967? And further, we would benefit from uh, a lead department coordinating coastal management issues. Minister. I don't think there necessarily has to be a lead department. We have two departments in this executive that have to deal with these issues. Uh, and to date, I, I have met with, with my colleague Michelle McLevine uh, twice now on this particular issue. We're due again to meet uh, next week. So that is three times in the first six months of this executive. Uh, I think that demonstrates our, our, our uh, certainly our determination to do something uh, regarding coastal erosion. We can't stop coastal erosion, but we have to manage its effects, uh, and that's something I think both myself uh, and the Agriculture and Environment Minister Michelle McIlvain are keen to do. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. In relation to inland flooding, can the Minister outline what works his department has completed to improve flood defences in my constituency, particularly along the Callan, Clanroy and Blackwater Town rivers? Minister. <laughs> this question is obviously about coastal erosion, so I applaud the, the member for getting in questions about his own constituency. I don't have that detail at hand. If the member wants to correspond with me, I'm more than happy to reply. Well, Kelly Armstrong. <laughs> Speaker, and I thank the Minister very much for mentioning coastal erosion. Does the Minister intend to introduce legislation to create a framework for managing and reducing coastal erosion and flooding? Yeah. Yeah, this is one of the issues that myself and Michelle McElveen will be picking up on. Is, you know, is, there, is there a requirement for legislation? Will it be of use uh, or will it be a hindrance? Uh, will it be effective in what we want to do over the next number of years? As I say, I, th I don't think we can approach this of wanting to eradicate or somehow uh, end coastal erosion. We can't, but we have to manage it. So that's something that we certainly will be discussing next week. Call William Humphrey. Mr. Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, you may be aware that the uh, Infrastructure Committee last week visited the Arts Peninsula. Indeed, the uh, Agriculture and Environment Minister joined us for that visit. Uh, Minister, we saw at first hand the coastal erosion that is taking place in various parts of the peninsula. I agree with the Minister what the Minister said about early invention, intervention being better. It is also cheaper. Will the Minister commit budgetary pressures uh, taken into consideration to work with groups like Eric Rini's group in uh, ARDS to deal with the issues that are affecting them and those communities where actually food paths are being washed away, young children being left exposed, old people with no lighting I think we have the school whatever in the morning? Minister. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, I think and certainly the groups you would have met and the individuals you would have met for many a year have been doing this work tirelessly themselves. They have a passion for it, they have a passion for the local communities uh, and to a large extent they have been ahead of the curve. So I am more than happy to certainly meet with those groups. I know in my own particular part of the world in South Down there are activists who, who regularly plant willow uh, and look to, to somehow uh, copper fasten the coast against this. Uh, and there is a, a extensive works have taken place around Ostrava and Warren Point. Um, to, to help us as well. And as you say, it is local volunteers, this local community who for a very long period of time have been involved in this, and yes, entirely. I would be more than happy to, to work with those people because, as I say, prevention is certainly better than cure and is also cheaper than the cure too. We move on. I call Catherine Seeley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number three, please. School children and young people are amongst the most vulnerable groups using our roads. My department delivers a wide range of road safety, educational activities and engineering initiatives to improve their safety. Various protective engineering interventions have been developed over the years, leading to the production of Transport NI's policy and procedure guide, which traffic engineers can draw from when assessing safety at individual schools. These measures include provision of enhanced signing and road markings, central islands, laybys and traffic calming features such as road humps. The enhanced signing largely incorporates flashing lights programmed to operate during term times at school opening and closing times. A more recent innovation has been the development of part-time 20 mile an hour speed limits at schools, especially at schools and roads where the national speed limit applies. The speed limit at these schools is reduced to 20 mile an hour at school opening and closing times during term time. 
I am particularly keen on this approach. However, the cost of providing these initial systems has been significant, with the most recent schemes costing, on average, £50,000 to install. I have therefore asked my officials to consider if more cost-effective solutions are available that would allow us to increase the current level of provision and treat more schools subject to available funding. I remain committed to continue to work towards reducing deaths and serious injuries on our roads, especially amongst vulnerable road users such as our school children. Thank you, Minister, and thank you for your answer. I recently received a letter from Primary School Pupils of St Mary's Derry Moor. Um, can I just ask you a question? That is a rural primary school. Can I ask why you are focusing on rural schools where the national speed limit applies? Absolutely, and I think it's fair to say that we need to target uh, limited resources to those schools that present the greatest risk to the safety of children initially. Uh, there is clear evidence that the higher a speed a vehicle travels, at the greater the severity of the injury to a pedestrian. Research has shown that for every one mile an hour reduction in speed, there is a 5% reduction in collisions. We also have to consider that rural schools are frequently located on unlit roads, which further adds to the hazards that school children are exposed to, especially in the dark winter days. Many schools in urban areas are already located within traffic cam zones, where traffic speeds are already reduced to well below 20 mph hour due to self-enforcing effects of the speed-reducing features, such as road humps and crossing facilities. Thank you. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I thank the Minister for his, uh, his answer here and indeed for piloting uh, further 20 mile per hour schemes outside of schools. Can he give an indication as to when the pilot for the model school in Carrick Fergus will actually be delivered and how soon thereafter will other schools such as Eaton Primary School, again on the busy A2 road, or Toria Primary School where there's a 40 mile per hour speed limit outside the school door, will be able to apply and be considered for future schemes? Yeah. Minister. I thank the member for his questions. Uh, and as good as I have become at retaining information, I apologise. I don't have the specific information of those very particular schools in the member's constituency. Uh, but again, if you correspond, I'm more than happy to get back. Look, uh, especially with regards to those rural school, small primary schools on roads where the national speed limit applies, uh, I am actively seeking ways in which we can address uh, the needs of those schools as soon as possible. I think there's about 100, approximately about 150 of those schools. Uh, so it's something that I'd be very keen to do uh, and something I want to move on as soon as possible. Well, Gordon Dunn. Thank, you, Mr. Thank the Minister for his answers today. Uh, and I do welcome the efforts in relation to the 20 miles per hour speed limits. And um, what is his assessment of the introduction of voluntary one-way systems where applicable? And would he agree that it's important that we get interagency Support, support to improve the safety outside our schools? No, sir. Yes, if we have any sort of solution that involves a partnership approach, an interagency approach, I think is to be welcomed, uh, not just from finances, but I think when you have more people working together with a single destination in mind, that, that certainly is beneficial. Uh, and I would probably give a guarded welcome to uh, voluntary one way systems. I, 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 I would caution, though, that whatever we do, and this is important when we go back to the roundels, etc., that we use, it has to have a basis in law. So, uh, you know, God forbid, there is some sort of accident that we don't have, have haven't created, uh, you know, a grey area where you know who, we don't know who's right and who's wrong. So, we need to make sure that we have a sound legal basis for whatever way we go forward. I call Trevor Lunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Would the minister consider devolving speed limits to local councils? on the basis that uh, it might allow them to uh, reduce similar speed limit reductions near other facilities apart from schools? Minister? <laughs> well, no, it's not something I've given any consideration to. Um, I'm not opposed to devolving powers to local councils. I, I think uh, a range of powers at local council and central, and central government I think can be a good thing, can be a healthy thing. Um, but certainly when it comes to this, I am personally responsible for the likes of this. And I'm more than happy to consider what other facilities, leisure facilities, community facilities, this can be done. It's something that the department, I, I was recently out at a GA club, and they have a, a problem. They sit in a rural road, much like a school, probably similar sort of numbers. Uh, and if we can come to similar arrangements, that, that can be fine. But I think you know, the, the department can be just as uh, sensitive to those demands as local council. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his uh, answers. Welcome the expansion of, of, of the safety zones, but the average safety zone will be about 300 metres, but the average journey to school, I think the mean average is 1.8 kilometres, so it won't have that much of an impact on active travel. Has the Minister given any consideration to extending the 20 mile per hour zone in urban areas? Minister. Yeah, I would love to extend the 20 mile zone everywhere. Uh, I have to start somewhere, and I think strategically the area is a high priority of those. I think it's 157 schools that currently sit on roads, uh, especially rural roads, uh, where the national speed limit applies. Uh, but again, the, the, the message is key, and we see this over the last week, and, and the tragic news, obviously, of the increased fatalities over the last number of days, that we, we can't engineer out some of the tragic news that we see. More than 95% of all fatalities and road traffic collisions are due to human error. So it's not something that we can end uh, the accidents and the collisions simply by extending 20 mile an hour zones. Uh, it can have an impact, surely. Uh, but we need to get the message out there to the driver that they should pay attention to, the, to their speed and that they should forget about the phone and never ever drink and drive. And it's important that we get that message out also. We move on. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four, please. Minister. Uh, just recently, I launched Exercise, Explore, Enjoy, my strategic plan for Greenways uh, on the 9th of November. The plan sets out my vision and a framework for a more strategic and ambitious programme to develop a Greenway network right across the whole of the North. Greenways can make a huge difference to the daily lives of people, provide, providing the opportunity to enjoy safe and easy access to fresh air and exercise, encouraging more people to commute to work by foot or bicycle, more children to walk or cycle to school and providing an accessible leisure resource for local people and visitors alike. The strategy outlines a longer-term plan for the development of a primary network of around 400 kilometres and a secondary network of around 600 kilometres. Page 23 of the strategy outlines a number of 10-year targets, including to have 75% of the primary network delivered by 2026 and to have 25% of the larger secondary network delivered by 2026 also. I have also set a target of increasing the number of journeys on the Greenways network and the National Cycle Network to 50 million per annum by 2026. On the 9th of November, I also announced grant funding to councils for 20 Greenway feasibility studies. These studies will lay the groundwork for the development of detailed plans and designs so that councils will be in a position to move as quickly as possible to start construction. Mr. Douglas, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. And could I declare that I am a trustee of the Collins Water Community Greenway, and I know we are certainly invited the Minister out there recently. Um, could I ask the, the Minister, in relation to this, this strategy, and I congratulate him for having the vision for this uh, Greenway strategy for a number of years, but could I ask the Minister, in terms of short-term gains, would he look at um, maybe the, the potential of supporting initiatives like Lighting for the Cumber Greenway? Or linking up the Cumber Greenway and the Conswater Community Greenway. I thank the member. Indeed, I thank the member for his ongoing um, appetite and enthusiasm for this particular uh, issue uh, and for active travel in general. I'd be more than happy to, to, to go out and to meet with the guys there. I think it's been a great success. Uh, even the, the likes of the. Uh, I suppose I should put on record to apologise. I, I, I was in the chamber and couldn't get to the launch of the CS Lewis score. I, I think it's a fantastic venture and all the best to the guys involved in that. Uh, the strategic plan for Greenways refers to guidance on engineering standards for Greenways, and furthermore, detailed information is included in the Common Trust Trans report, which is available on my department's website. Specifically in relation to the Cumber Greenway, my department will shortly undertake a public consultation on the Belfast Bicycle Network, which includes the Cumber Greenway. The consultation will seek views on a number of improvements to this Greenway, including lighting part of the route. Following consultation on the network, consideration will be given to whether lighting is appropriate on parts of the route, taking into account environmental concerns and the needs of the adjacent properties and neighbours. I call Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his responses thus far. Um, would the Minister give a commitment to meet with the Lagan Navigation Trust to explore the unique opportunities that exist in linking the Greenways Network with Lagan Valley Regional Park and the Blueways Network to allow for the greatest possible benefit to the network? Minister. 
Yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, I, I, to declare an interest, I'm a regular user of the Ligon towpath in particular. Uh, I think it has uh, great heritage, it has great potential also for the future. You only have to go on to it uh, at the weekend and it's absolutely buzzing. It's like a high street in the town. Uh, it's great to see and certainly I think the long-term vision of the Ligon linking into the restoration of the Ulster Canal and even further is a project uh, that is worth good attention in the years ahead. Uh, I, I only wish I had the money to start work tomorrow because I say it would be a fantastic project, but yes, be more than happy to do so. Call Nicola Mallon. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, uh, given the calls by the CEO of the Titanic Quarter that um, Northern Ireland needs another major attraction, what his assessment is of whether Greenways could be that attraction? Minister. Yeah, I was very clear. I, I, I was delighted and privileged to launch this uh, Greenway plan on the old uh, Belfast and County Down railway line uh, just outside Dundrum, um, a, a line that used to bring hundreds, um, if not thousands, of tourists from Belfast to the North Down area and down into my own part in South Down around Newcastle. Uh, there's no reason why we can't extend out when we go to active travel and cycling. You know, when you talk to anybody involved in the tourist, tourism industry, they want uh, active tourism activities to take people out of the city to destinations such as Newcastle. Um, so I think this definitely can be very much part of it. Uh, and as I say, some of, the, some of the schemes are very exciting, up in the Glens and uh, even linking Carningford Lock with Loch Ney. I think there's some great schemes uh, and certainly it's something for us to be excited of over the next five to ten years. I call Paula Bradshaw. Okay, Mr Deputy Speaker. Minister, can I ask you about Carrie Duff, the proposed um, Greenway in, in that area, and about what discussions you've had with the Council up there about progressing it? As you know, the feasibility study is underway at the minute and it would be great to get that up the priority list a bit. Minister. Yeah, I, I haven't had any specific discussions uh, with Lisburn and Castlereagh Council, that would be, uh, looking after that one. Uh, I, I know it's a particular scheme that first came on to uh, my horizon w when the Finance Minister, Martin and Willier, uh, once talked about it. Again, knowing the lay of the land in that particular part of the world, I think it would be a fantastic uh, asset. Uh, I think it also would play a, a vital role in alleviating congestion from the city when you consider the success of the Kearns Hill Park and Ride facility. Uh, to be able to have a greenway from Carried Off down to that particular point and down through Beaver Forest, I think, would be a great asset again. Uh, and certainly, I would encourage the Council to do all that they can during the detailed design. Um, because, as say, you know, like other schemes that I've mentioned already, uh, you know, this could be a huge asset going forward for us. We move on. I call Mr. Trevor Clark. Uh, question number five. Minister. My department's Transport and I is aware of a number of collisions in the vicinity of the Ballygrooby roundabout. These collisions include loss of control type incidents for vehicles exiting the roundabout onto the A6 Castle Road travelling towards Antrim. Following an investigation of the causes, a scheme is being developed to provide high friction surfacing and an amended white lining layout on the exit towards Antrim from the Ballygrooby roundabout to address the loss of control type incidents. It is anticipated that this work will be completed in early 2017. As part of the investigation into the collisions uh, at the roundabout, an assessment was carried out for the provision of additional vehicle restraint systems on the exit from the roundabout towards Antrim. The location, however, did not meet the criteria for a scheme proposal to be taken forward. There are no plans currently, therefore, to provide additional vehicle restraint systems at the roundabout at this time. It should be borne in mind that vehicle restraint systems are used to protect the occupants of a vehicle from striking an off-road hazard after loss of control of the vehicle. The provision of high friction surfacing is aimed at preventing the loss of the control of the vehicle in the first place. Mr. Clark, supplementary. And can I thank the Minister for that answer? Um, I'm sure the Minister appreciates appreciate I travel that road daily. And however, all the accidents actually would happen on the road is the, the, road, the, the, the section of the road in relation to the Randallstown Road where the safety restraints aren't. And indeed, the ones that were placed, I would suggest there's no hazards actually on that. So can I ask the Minister, maybe through his office, would they actually review how the original decision to, to put up the first safety restraint systems were put in place with a view that if they actually were put in the wrong place, that the area where most accidents happens, where they're talking about the high friction are, are, happen, are sorry, suggested to happen, that some other form of mechanism is put there that's more adequate than actually the high friction surface? As the Minister for speedy answer. Well, again, is, I suppose touching on the logic applied to previous questions about prevention being the best uh, source of, the, of cure and certainly better than the cure. I think in this instance we have engineered solutions here uh, that certainly have a, the highest impact. Um, I 
no problem in, in the future, whenever we, uh, these works are complete in the next couple of months, uh, this will be done. Uh, if the member uh, wants to correspond again, feels there's still a problem, uh, I have no problem again perhaps looking at it in, in the future. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr Steve Aiken. Okay. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And may I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Um, could the Minister outline any discussions he has had with the Minister of Finance in respect to working with councils on infrastructure projects? Minister. Yes, I suppose formally and informally, since coming into post, as I have alluded to uh, in previous answers, uh, I have had discussions with the Finance Minister uh, quite regularly uh, regarding finance, <laughs> most particularly. Uh, as I have mentioned, there are somewhere in the region of about £5 billion worth of projects sitting in my department at different stages. Um, some of them simply uh, a concept on a piece of paper, um, but some of them maybe near in the end, uh, we all know well. Uh, I will get approximately £1.5 billion uh, over the, the next few years to develop infrastructure capital projects. You can see there is a massive gap between what we could do and what we can do. Uh, so I certainly have said, put on record from the start, I want to look at equipping myself with the toolbox. Uh, of funding arrangements and of ways to finance these. I'm aware that a number of councils are very keen. At, at the NILGA conference, I took the opportunity uh, to talk about greater partnership, uh, about delivering some of these projects. Um, and certainly, I, I have got a sense from the business community uh, of a fresh approach to this that the business community want to do more also. Uh, so I, I don't want to say no to everything. Certainly, everything for me is on the table. Let's consider it, uh, but I will caveat that by saying it has to work in the best interests of the public purse long term. Mr. Aiken, supplementary. Uh, may I thank the minister? And you know what's going to come next, don't you? <laughs> Could the minister support the use of the infrastructure fund in joint venture partnerships between the Northern Ireland Executive, councils, and private enterprise for the much-needed Ballyclare bypass relief road and the dual carriageway to the airport? Please. Minister. <laughs> Again, you know, infrastructure projects such as because there are a number of these projects across. I know Lisburn City Council are looking at one. Uh, I know in my own particular area of Downpatrick there, there is a need to, to address this type of uh, project. Projects that up to now perhaps finances would dictate uh, and certainly from central government to say, look, we just simply don't have the money. Sorry folks, Shine, it's on the shelf and that's it. We certainly, I think, should look at ways to say, no, how, is there other ways out there? Are there tools at our disposal here we're not using? So I'd say to the member, I'm more than happy to look at it. If the member wants to correspond with me and uh, to put some of these ideas down, to have a discussion, I'd be more than happy to do that. Colin Pat Sheehan. Uh, little ask Kion Korda. Uh, could I ask the Minister if he believes that the Irish Government should reinstate its commitment of £400 million to help construct the A5? Minister. In short, absolutely yes. Uh, I, I think now is probably a timely period uh, where once the £400 million was uh, promised uh, and then the crisis occurred and certainly the Dublin government uh, seems to have got nervous and, and put 75 back on the table. I think now as we approach there is a mid-term review of national infrastructure and investment in the south that is a timely period uh, for the Dublin government to consider again putting uh, all of the £400 million back on the table. It's simply, and again, I think a lot of people see the A5 simply as a, a project for, for, the, for the North and the Northern Executive. Uh, it's simply not the case. Uh, this is a key infrastructure project that would open up the entire North West region. Uh, so I think it's a responsibility, certainly, of ourselves here in Belfast and the Dublin government to do all that we can. I, re I recently was in Carrick and Cross uh, and speaking to local people there. Uh, who said that their town would be dead now if it wasn't for the fact that they were so close um, to the major infrastructure uh, linking Belfast and Dublin. When you speak to the chief executives of council, which I have along the route of the proposed A5 in places in Donegal and Calvin uh, and Fermanagh uh, and certainly even into Mid-Ulster, they are crying out for this piece of investment and it is something I think uh, I am determined obviously to work with partners in Dublin to deliver. Um, so again, it was not perhaps as short as saying absolutely yes, but yes they should. Mr. Uh, and just could I ask the Minister briefly if he has any plans to meet his southern counterparts in the near future around this issue? Minister. Minister. Yeah. 
Well, I, I recently took the opportunity uh, at a north-south sectoral uh, meeting to, to speak with Michael Ring, TD, who is Minister of State uh, for Regional Development. Uh, I, I think certainly uh, <laughs> Fine Gael are, are sensitive, I think, coming out of the last election that uh, they perhaps were rejected in western and more regional parts uh, around the, I think the lack of development uh, in regional areas. So I think Michael Ring has a sense that he wants to do something. He's very keen to work uh, on projects such as this to, to bring regional balance to investment. Uh, and also next month, in a, actually in a couple of weeks, I'll be meeting with Shane Ross, the Minister for Transport, uh, to also discuss a number of transport issues. Uh, on top of the agenda, of course, will be the A5. Colin Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister consider a review of the loading bays which have been put in place in Bangor Town Centre by Transport NI, which are leading to mass confusion for shoppers uh, and residents who are trying to get parked in our town centres? Minister. Uh, again, uh, I have nothing instinctively uh, against reviewing something like this. If the, if the member wants to correspond to me to, to, to shed some light on what he believes is the problem, I'm more than happy to do so. Mr. Eason. Um, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, Minister, um, a lot of businesses have now been approached to me, and these um, loading bays are actually affecting the lack of car parking facilities in Bangor Town Centre and are affecting trade. Would the Minister maybe grant me a meeting to discuss this with some of the traders? Minister. Yes, uh, I, the member will appreciate that the, the diary is hectic, but yes, looking into the future in the new year, I'd be happy to sit down and take five minutes to discuss this. I Call Gary uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can, I, can the Minister give an update on the A6 upgrade following the recent uh, court decision? And will any section of the A6 uh, be able to begin in the meantime? Yes, not a problem. Uh, we'll look at, as I said, as I said last week, uh, where I was disappointed, of course, uh, that Justice McGuire came to the decision he did. I wasn't overly shocked or surprised, given that the bar is quite low when you're applying for leave to, to challenge that. Uh, I was pleased that he did reject five of the six grounds uh, of the appeal. So my department uh, certainly will very speedily uh, get our papers involved, get them into the courts. And uh, I even welcome the, re the remarks from Justice McGuire too. And he recognised the strategic importance of this piece of investment and that we need to have a speedy resolution to that. Um, so I am absolutely confident uh, that when it comes to the, the substantial hearing in, in the new year, uh, that the department will be confident or will be successful in that. Uh, on the back of the, the decision, I also took the opportunity to discuss with officials the technical possibilities of moving forward with the, the money next section, which obviously the member as a commuter will, will know all too well, uh, and that's something we are actively now looking at. Preliminary work is ongoing uh, on the stretch and will continue to be ongoing in that particular stretch at the very least. Um, and certainly, if we can progress with works within the, the legal contracts which have been agreed, we absolutely will. Mr. Pendleton, Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Sorry, can I... order. Can I ask uh, those members with penetrating whispers to uh, be a little quieter? Mr. Middleton. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the Minister uh, for his um, response? Can the Minister give a commitment that whatever finance has been allocated to the A6, that it will be secure and that it will not uh, be spent elsewhere, as other members of the House have suggested? Minister. Yeah, absolutely. The A6 and the upgrade of the A6 is an executive flagship project. Uh, so, in short, the money is going nowhere else. I call Jerry Carroll. Uh, I'd like to ask the Minister if he plans to intervene and ensure TransLink becomes a fully accredited, accredited living wage employer, given that TransLink management have betrayed the pledge they made to do just that. And as you may be aware, they have refused to offer minimum wage workers anything more than the bare statutory annual increase, which will see lowest paid, lowest paid workers lose out. I think we have uh, the question, Mr. Carroll. increase Carl. be given to all other TransLink members Thank you, of staff. Minister. Look, I, I engage regularly uh, with TransLink officials. Uh, I also had the opportunity to, to meet them. We, we had a very productive meeting with union members uh, lately from TransLink. Um, I think we had a very productive meeting. So certainly I, the member has raised an important issue, and certainly when, the next time I meet with TransLink officials, I will raise this issue. Mr. Carroll, supplementary. I thank the minister for his reply. And just on that, would he agree to meet unions and staff affected by this particular proposal to hear their concerns about how low pay affects them and their families? Minister. Yeah, uh, I took the opportunity recently when meeting the unions to, to open up uh, a continual and regular engagement with them. Uh, I, I sensed uh, 
a sense of frustration on their behalf that they maybe didn't have that uh, in recent years. So I certainly will be keen to, to open that up. I think it is productive for my department to do so. Dr. Stephen Farry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm back to uh, Major Roads. Uh, and while recognising that both the A5, A5 and A6 are priorities in absolute terms, can I ask the Minister to comment on figures he provided to me, which shows that the peak number of movements in terms of York Street Exchange is over 111,000 cars, whereas the A5 and A6 only peak at 20 and 26,000? And ask him, does he believe that the York Street Interchange is actually utterly essential to not just the economy of Belfast, but indeed to all of Northern Ireland. Minister, yeah, there, there, there are other statistics, and we can bring other statistics out. And I've alluded to this already. If you had asked for fatality statistics at York Street Interchange and compared them with the A5 and A6, which you've just done with something else, you would have an entirely different set of statistics. Uh, I may be wrong. I may be wrong on this, but I, I am not aware of any fatalities at the York Street Interchange. I may be wrong on that. I am aware of nearly 50 fatalities on the A5 in the last decade. So, as I have said, strategically for me, there are a number of criteria we can base this on. Certainly one of the most important, I think, for someone in my position is to make our roads as safe as possible. Dr. Farre, supplementary. Uh, while well, accepting, of course, that good road design is important in terms of road safety, as indeed is enforcement of the traffic legislation uh, by, the, by, the, by the police, can I also ask the Minister to recognise that the benefit to cost ratio in terms of York Street Exchange is 2.33. I accept that the A6 at Ranelstown is of a similar nature, but those are the most beneficial to our economy. And if the Minister has been rational in terms of his approach towards allocating the funds to maximise the benefit to the economy, does he recognise that both of those two projects are actually top of the pile? Minister. As I said, I, I, I would not have stood in this House recently uh, and made the decision to proceed with the York Street Interchange if I did not accept the arguments that this was a strategic piece of infrastructure that not just the City of Belfast but the economy as a whole requires. I absolutely accept that. But as also pointed out, I, I do not have the financial uh, ability right now uh, at my disposal to, to build everything we absolutely want, so I need to prioritise. When we look at the economy, and this is something where I think we need to get to as well, we continue to talk in this House and in, in, in the public airwaves about moving cars. We need to talk about moving people. Moving people is good for business in and out of the Belfast city. Moving cars is not. You know, what are we to do next after York Street? Are we to bulldoze half of Great Victoria Street because we need two extra lanes in Great Victoria Street? Are we to demolish Belfast City Hall because we need a bigger roundabout in Belfast City Hall? We need to talk about moving people in and out of Belfast, not moving cars in and out of Belfast. Well, good luck with that one. Um, Mr Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, and you were relieved to know that uh, I think we, today we probably have flogged York Street Interchange to death, but I uh, believe you and me will be coming back to it. Minister, can I ask you, in respect of rural roads, and particularly the coast road in East Antrim, um, where from time to time the road is, cl is closed due to landslips, what action uh, you will take to ensure that this winter the road will remain open? Minister. Well, as outlined, I, I'm meeting with the Agriculture and Environment Minister, Michelle McAveen, next week to take forward a number of proposals on dealing with coastal erosion. As I said, it's, it's, it's an issue I think we have to deal with and manage. It's not an issue we can uh, eradicate or, or get rid of entirely. We need to work with it. Uh, I, I, look, I come from a rural background. I come from a rural constituency. When I came into post, I made clear that we need to do more in rural areas especially. Uh, you know, and it, it may be a drop in the ocean, and excuse the pun on that, but the £10 million I put towards investment in rural roads uh, certainly, I think, has, has went down well in rural areas and is providing a good service. It's, as I say, it's only a drop in the ocean. We require hundreds of millions of pounds more for, uh, our, for structural maintenance. We know that over the last number of years, due to economic climate, uh, that there is somewhere in the region of a billion pound backlog in structural maintenance. That's not something I'm going to solve today or tomorrow. We need to have a longer-term strategic view of how to do that, uh, and that will be a very, very difficult thing to do uh, in the economic climate in which we find ourselves. Mr. Dixon, supplementary. The Minister makes reference to a strategic view, and it is important that there is a strategy in relation to this particular road, not uh, only for tourists who use it and yet are regularly stopped because of landslips onto the road, but also, particularly in the winter time, for residents who live in the area and for whom it is the only way to get to work or to school. Minister, absolutely, and I accept that. Indeed, you know, you know, two million pounds has been spent 
on dealing with coastal erosion in that particular part of the world. Uh, you know, when you speak to people, I know the committee just recently were in the Ards Peninsula. You, you travel on down the down coast in, in Warren Point and Restraver, uh, you know, you find similar problems that certainly the departments are starting now to to have to grapple with and going to have to continue to grapple with perhaps at an accelerating rate over the next number of years. And that's why myself and uh, Michelle McElveen have, I think, brought a bit of focus to this issue. We, the two departments are going to have to work together uh, and set out a number of targets over the next number of years that we want to meet. Uh, Mr. Philip Logan, quick question. There may not be time for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks for uh, squeezing me in. Uh, the Minister will be aware that I recently wrote to him in regard to his department's uh, Transport NI's Northern Fund uh, for Minor Works. Uh, would the Minister commit to reviewing that in, in, in light of uh, something like over 100 projects on that, that list, which could take, given the fund that's available, could take up to 10 years to complete? Thank you. Minister. Uh, <laughs> You know, I don't mean to be facetious, but the, everybody in this chamber could say exactly the same thing about their own particular part of the world. Um, and that, that really is a situation that we find ourselves in. I've mentioned before, we have a structural maintenance backlog of somewhere in the region of a billion pounds. Um, we know the economic forecast coming, especially from uh, the, the Chancellor's statement last week and over the next number of years is not going to change. If anything, it may get sharper uh, over the next number of years. So I think we need to take a longer strategic view of this. Um, I know a number of these projects in a number of areas um, certainly deal with road safety, so we need to look at what we prioritise and how we prioritise. Um, but certainly, it's something that we'll, I will continue to do while I'm post. Okay, time is up, members, and I ask the House to take their ease while we make changes to the top table. Thank you.